This is Keys to the Shop, episode 232, Rebuilding Your Staff with Excellence, with Dave Stahoviak. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Christy Furio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, I want to encourage you to subscribe to Keys to the Shop podcast and also uh, follow us on Instagram. In addition to that, if you could leave a rating or review uh, for the show, that would be amazing as well. And I want to let you know that uh, Keys to the Shop is more than a podcast. Keys to the Shop also offers consultation and coaching to you. If you need a trusted advisor for your next coffee project, clarity on some problems that you're having in your coffee shop, or you just want to take your operations to the next level, I would encourage you to reach out, chris at keys to the shop.com. We can set up a free exploratory call, and traditionally, uh, Keys to the Shop Consulting has done um, in person operational assessments helped people uh, open their first coffee bars and design their coffee bars as well as their menus and their management structures, um, helped people through some challenges that they've had with their uh, personnel and generally offered great guidance over the phone too. We offer phone consultation uh, in addition to all of that uh, and much more. If you go to keystotheshop.com backslash consulting, you'll find more information. But again, if you want to work one-on-one with me, email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers because they curate the best equipment from all over the world, and then they match it perfectly with the needs of their customers. Wherever you are in your business, if you are just starting your first coffee business and need to be outfitted with the right equipment, or you are looking to upgrade what you currently have or expand your shops in your shop into shops, like in your second store or third store, Prima Coffee can work with you to get the exact right coffee equipment for your situation. Anywhere from espresso machines, brewers, grinders, uh, to restaurant equipment like undercounter refrigeration, they've got you covered. And when you go to the website, prima-coffee.com. You'll see the amazing selection, and you will also see that they put a lot of information on their website, a lot of free resources, videos and tutorials, blogs that will help you brew better coffee and use the equipment well, maintain the equipment well, because they not only care about equipping you with equipment, but also equipping you with the knowledge to succeed in specialty coffee. That's why I love working with them, and I think you should work with them too. So find out more information, reach out to them over at prima-coffee.com. This episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series, the world's leading plant-based performance beverage because they work to develop these products for baristas and with a lot of feedback from the barista community. So you know whether you're using the almond, soy, coconut, rice, hemp, or oat on your bar, you're going to be getting a beverage that stands up to the heat from steaming, produces an amazing, silky, latte art-ready texture, and keeps the flavor balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. These are really important factors in helping your customers have the best plant-based beverage experience in your cafe. And when you're serving the Pacific Barista Series, you can rest assured that that's what they're getting the best. To find out more information, go to their website, pacificfoodservice.com. Again, that's pacificfoodservice.com. If you're looking for the best plant-based beverages, then I'd say look no further than the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. So today we are going to be talking about rebuilding your staff with excellence. And there are so many um, details that go into this. I mean, it is unfortunate, the situation that we find ourselves in, of course, um, that we can't bring back all the people that we want to bring back. And there's some complicated things to consider when we're considering who to bring back, how to uh, go about that, and in, in a way that is going to be good for the person, good for you as a owner or manager, and, and good for the staff overall, their morale, their culture. It's all a huge consideration. And I'm really excited to bring back to the show Dave Stahoviak, past guest and really one of the world's foremost thinkers in uh, business and management. He has such a clear sense for what the best practices are around this sub- these subjects. 
On top of being an amazing executive coach, uh, Dave, since 2011, has run the Coaching for Leaders podcast um, that has been downloaded over 12 million times, and it is literally the number one search result on Apple Podcasts for coaching in the United States. Um, He hosts such people as Simon Sinek, Daniel Goleman, Patrick Lencioni, Seth Godin, Daniel Pink, Adam Grant. I mean, the list is staggering, and the wisdom that you gain from his podcast is just unparalleled. It's always an honor to have Dave on the show and a double honor to count Dave as as a friend. So if you're in a position where you're a little uncertain about what to do when it comes to the restructuring, basically, of an organization, uh, like so many of us are experiencing, lots of different teams now than we had before, um, this episode is going to be a real asset to you. Here now is my conversation about rebuilding your staff with excellence with Dave Stahoviak. All right, Dave, welcome back to Keys to the Shop. I'm super glad to have you here, as always. Chris, my friend, it is always a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. And um, I, I I really enjoy your perspective on subjects like this and because you bring a lot of clear and reasoned thinking, especially in a time where, um, you know, maybe that kind of stuff is at a, a short supply. <laughs> I guess I'd like to start out by just talking a little bit about, from your perspective, what have you seen change in the the market of you know employers and employees and in that whole climate that we we kind of find ourselves in the middle of right now? Wow, it's um, it's hard to answer that question and think about what hasn't changed in the last six months or so because so much has changed. And I wish we were having this conversation under different contexts and especially in your industry, Chris, like, boy, it's been so heavily impacted by everything going on and the closures and quarantines and and all of that. And so I think at a big picture macro level, the big shift has been Before all this happened, the economy was humming along really well for a lot of people. Not everyone, of course, but the markets were at all-time highs. Unemployment was at all-time lows. And it was very much a employee's job market in that there were a lot of opportunities. Uh, If you left a position, chances are there was going to be another position available for you fairly soon. You'd likely find more work. And so uh, the thing that I would hear very consistently from employers was really trying to find and locate the best talent out there. And that has changed a lot in the last six months. Now, we, of course, have gone through this just very difficult time, especially in your industry, where uh, businesses have had to shut down for a period of time. Some businesses have already closed. The unemployment rate is at all-time highs from from historic perspectives, at least here in the United States. Um, I don't know what the numbers are in other places, but it's uh, certainly higher than they were six months ago. And now we find ourselves in this interesting place as business owners where there are, uh, there's certainly uh, so many challenges we're navigating. And uh, we also have, a, you know, strangely, a little bit more opportunity in that being more selective with who we bring back into the organization and, um, and thinking about what roles would look like and what, who we would bring back and what kinds of ways we'd go about that, whereas we may not have had some of those choices as much five or six months ago. And it's not the reason any of us would want to be in that position. But I think it does open up some consideration for owners and managers that they may not have spent as much time thinking about five or six months ago when it was harder to find people. And now thinking about things a little differently as we're all in this big shift of how we think about roles and onboarding people and what it is that we can do to really staff our organizations in a way that's going to be beneficial to customers and to grow the business. That's really interesting that we are 
I think you could argue that we were always sort of thinking about those roles, but now it's there's so much on the line, and there are only so many positions to to give out. Um, I know, uh, you know, where I work, there's a couple of um, you know, places out of the you know several cafes that are are not open anymore, and you know there's there's shifting and reshuffling of teams, the teams that you used to have in the cafe are now made up of other people and you know maybe even some new faces but uh, maybe faces from other shops and the cultures are shifting and uh, that is is really seemingly an uh, a situation where urgency is being felt by you know managers who have to put people on the schedule and um, I, I wonder if you could just kind of it, elaborate a little bit on the kinds of considerations that um, managers and and owners are having to make now, uh, and what what kind of thinking are we subject to right now in the midst of this this crisis that we should probably be aware of in order to make good decisions? Well, I think to answer that question well, let me go back to what we just said a moment ago on the environment, and I think the thinking for a lot of leaders in a lot of situations, and certainly the economy in the way it was six months ago, was, wow, I need another position filled or someone has left and I need to bring someone in very quickly because um, I'm going to have a hard time finding someone. So the tendency is to be able to bring on the first person you can find. Um, and when it's an employee's job market, you tend to be a little bit more um, you tend to be a little more lax with your expectations and um, and who you're looking for and do they fit the role perfectly. And you might make a hire fairly quickly before you've really thought a lot of that through. And, and, and in fact, that's a trap all of us fall into as leaders and owners of businesses in that we sometimes think about the person first. We have a person who's come on our radar screen for whatever reason, either they've applied or we've gotten a referral. And then maybe we think about, okay, would they, you know, would they be good for this role? You know, can I get them most of the way there? That kind of a thing. And the difference now is that for unfortunate reasons and for reasons none of us would have wanted, but the reality is, is that we have probably in most places a little bit more, um, a little bit more choice as far as who we bring on. And whereas we might have had 10 employees in the past, maybe there's the opportunity to bring back two or three or five or whatever that number is for your organization. And you do have the opportunity in a lot of places to be a little bit more selective. And I think the danger for us as leaders is to make decisions in the context of today like we made them six months ago. Mm. To hire someone very quickly and to say, okay, I need someone for this shift and this person's schedule fits and it's the first person I've talked to this week and so I'm going to get them into the role pretty quickly. And I don't think that's ever a great way to approach things even in good times, um, but it is the where a lot of us tend to default to. Whereas today, there's probably a lot more opportunity to step back a bit and say, okay, wait a minute, before I bring on new people, before I bring back people into the organization. What's the role that I really need them to do? What kind of skills do I need for this particular position? Uh, if I'm bringing in a shift supervisor, what does that person need to be good at? And who am, I really, who am I really looking for that can do that well? And so one of the mantras I'm often sharing with our academy members is role first, person second. Because the tendency is for us to have someone come across our radar screen and start thinking about the role in the context of that person. Whereas if we as leaders have thought through in advance, what's the role that I need to have filled? What are the, uh, what are the job responsibilities of this role? What are the talents that I am looking for for a person to have? And that's very clear in our minds first. Then, as people come onto our radar screen, or we're thinking about bringing someone back into the organization, or we're going out and doing recruiting, uh, whatever that venue is, then we can start to, when we meet someone, 
we've already made the decision of what's the kind of person I need to find, what are the talents that I'm looking for, and then we can more accurately assess that person based upon that role. And I think the opportunity here, if there is an opportunity in this, in this crisis that we've all find ourselves in, is when bringing people back into the organization is to do some of that as well, of rather than just hiring everyone back right away, of doing some thinking about, okay, what are the roles that I really need right now? What is this, how does this look differently given the new context of this world that we live in? And what do those roles look like? And do the people that I might have automatically brought back before, do they fit the roles that I'm going to need for that new reality? And if they do, great. But if they don't, of taking a moment to hit the pause button and saying, okay, maybe who do I not bring back because they weren't, they're not the right fit for this role, or maybe they weren't the right fit before either. And where do I now find that person who would be the better fit and really match the role that's going to serve the business long-term? That's a key right there. Long-term thinking instead of that short-term, you know, just pulling the trigger on the decision to bring a person back because you like them. And in coffee bars, it's really a, um, a unique situation because there's a lot of camaraderie, a lot of elbow to elbow work where the culture is really thick and there's a lot of familial, you know, elements that, drive us to make those types of decisions. And as you're describing this, I think a lot of us are thinking that that makes sense. And that sounds refreshingly simple. However, um, there's this, <laughs> you know, the, it, when it hits the atmosphere of the, the, you know, usual environment of my decisions, there's a lot of atmospheric drag, you know, that the momentum that we've had of making you know, less than, you know, calculated decisions for a long time because we, we could get away with it and now we can't. So it's, it's not really second nature to us to do that. So on top of having this like really critical time in our business, we're, you're asking us to be very, a, a little bit more analytical than we're used to being. So we're way outside of our comfort zone. So I guess maybe, uh, bolstering that a little bit for people by saying like, well, what what do we win in the long term by by doing that you know, so that it can kind of get us over that that hump of you know maybe not bringing back that person that we didn't we we really wanted to but it didn't make sense and if we had the, our way we would have done it and then maybe long term it would have worked out but talk to us a little bit about the long term benefits and and some of the downsides to you know not going with that more reasoned approach to to uh restructuring and bringing people back. Yeah, I think like so many things in life, it's, um, you know, a pound of prevention is worth, uh, or an ounce of prevention rather is worth a pound of cure, right? So if I'm willing to do a little bit of work and take a little bit of the pain upfront, then long-term that's probably going to serve me better and reduce a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, time down the road. And every single one of us in this conversation, you, me, Chris, um, and everyone listening has hired someone <laughs> in the past and had that thought in the back of their mind, like, uh, I'm kind of thinking maybe this person isn't the perfect fit for this role, but I really need someone, right? Mm -hmm. And and then sure enough, like three weeks, four weeks into it, two months into it, you're like, oh man, I so wish I had not hired this person. And it's not that the, you can't potentially dismiss them and, and exit them out of the business, but it becomes so much more difficult to the point you just made. Once someone has interacted with the staff and knows customers and is part of the culture, it becomes so much more difficult to make a decision at that point then for them to exit the organization than it is to not have hired them in the first place when you could have foreseen the issue in advance. And all of us have been caught off guard. It doesn't matter how good a job you do hiring, there are going to be times you're going to make bad hires, right? But there are some situations that you can see coming. And I know there are times I've seen things coming and I just didn't want to face the problem. I think back to years ago, I was managing a part-time staff and I had, um, in my situation, I was wanting to elevate someone uh, who in our part-time staff who was going to become um, a bit of a shift manager and would supervise other part-time employees. And he was 80% ready for the role. 
but there was this 20% that um, he was a little bit arrogant in his personality. And some of the other staff members um, really, he kind of rubbed the wrong way with that arrogance that he would, he would bring into a lot of his interactions. And I was, I was sort of convinced that I could solve that problem yeah. <laughs> by spending some time with him. I can change him. Well, yes, exactly. Um, Cause I am all powerful. So I can change this person, <laughs> of course. And, um, and so I was, we were, I had been talking with him about what this next role would look like. And we had talked through some of the things he'd need to work on. And he was 80% there. And then as we went over time, over this month or two process of talking about this position, um, it, it kind of became apparent he was never going to change. And I suddenly got an opportunity to move to another location. And I made the decision before I left for the new role that I would elevate him into the position anyway, even though I knew he wasn't quite there, but I felt like, well, he's 85% there, he's 90% there, he's got this one thing, it might be an issue down the road, but I think he'll probably come around, even though he's shown no evidence <laughs> that he's able to uh -huh. set this up. And so I elevated him into the role, literally the last day I was at that location. And then I left. And, um, and I started hearing stories after I left from my colleagues who I left behind of this person really not working well at all. And in fact, um, it worked so poorly that the, um, at the time, the regional manager at, uh, at this organization had to actually step in and um and come back and talk to me about this bad hire oh, no. <laughs> that i'd made and um and in a and i won't bore you with why but i ended up coming back to that location a few months later and then i had to dismiss the person and it was just a mess and it made so many people's lives difficult for many months because i wasn't willing to first and foremost look at the role what I was doing was I was thinking about the person. I have this person who it would be good for me and it would check my box to have them in this mm -hmm. role so I can have that nice and tidily put together before I left for a new role. And I wasn't thinking about what the role really needed. And what that role really needed first and foremost was someone who was coach-like, who was willing to spend time supporting colleagues and employees, who was willing to give positive feedback. And that was the one thing this person did not have. They checked all the other boxes, but the one box they really needed to check, they didn't. And so because I was so focused myopically on getting the person into the role and then checking the box, I missed the most important thing. And it ended up, uh, it ended up costing tons of time. Uh, there were people in tears uh, at one point about this situation when it got finally resolved. It, it really was a failure of leadership on my part to not have spent the time thinking about the role first and the long term and what's the right decision for the business. There are so many <laughs> intertwining parts in that story, Dave. And as you're telling it, I'm just like, I'm shuddering <laughs> like the last day and you just leave and like, you know, have, have fun with this person, have no idea how it's going to work out, but <laughs> yeah, uh, it yeah. seems similar to how a lot of owners put, put managers into place in new locations in a cafe. They say, well, you know, sometimes there's a, there's nepotism involved. It's like, this is my brother, or this is my friend. And they have a lot of experience outside the industry that's going to help us here or whatever. Or, or sometimes it's someone from within the organization. And because you're not part of the culture of the, you know, day-to-day -day operations, you have no idea, like the nuance of this person. You just see the, you know, you know, for lack of a better word, they're maybe a good brown noser and <laughs> they can, you know, convince you. So yeah, I certainly have experienced that type of thing where people, are willing to put another person into a, a position. Um, but the ramifications, it seems like there's not only did you suffer uh, in the business, but the employees did as well. And uh, that person, 
him himself. Like I'm sure in a different circumstance, that uh, individual could have flourished um, in in spite of whatever shortcomings he had. It just wasn't the right position for him. So it seems like there's there's a lot more to consider than simply what you know is is saying straightforward. Well, what does the job require? Um, it's almost like we have to consider who is being impacted by this job and what do they need from it? Indeed. And to your point, that employee who I was talking about was a superstar in the prior role and probably would have been for a long time and been very successful and was beloved by customers and staff. And it just wasn't the right role for for him. And I think about this in the context of succession planning, which I think is one of the most important skills that leaders and owners need to at least get decent at thinking about, and it's one we don't talk about very much. Um, But our tendency is for many of us, and I think especially when it comes to part-time staff, is um, to not really think about what succession planning looks like and who's going to be next in the position until someone vacates a role, someone leaves for another opportunity or, um, or schedules change. And then there's that moment of panic, right? Of mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, uh, Thursday afternoons and, and, and Friday afternoons, all of a sudden we have a hole in the schedule. And, and then we need to find the first person we can find that we think would be a good fit and, um, and, and bring them in. And, and to some extent, there's always going to be the reality of that in a, in a, biz, in a coffee business, certainly. Um, yet, if we can spend a little bit of time thinking, okay, I know that at some point here, we're going to be needing a new... Um, we're going to be needing a new manager here in the business in the next four or five months. What would that path look like? And who are the kinds of people in the organization now that potentially could be developed to get into that role? And what's the work that I can be doing as a leader in the coming months to help prepare that person for that role? Um, and then also, as positions vacate, I have a very clear idea of what are the skill sets I'm looking for, how do I assess that um, before I necessarily go and find the next person and, and just slot them in. And, and this is where, if, you know, again, for reasons none of us wanted, but we all find ourselves in this position right now of reassessing a lot of things. And certainly in the coffee business, reassessing who comes back into the organization. And so it's an opportunity to do some of this if you haven't done it before of thinking about, okay, what are the roles that we need now? How does this look differently in this environment where um, there's lockdowns and the economy's changing and people are doing more takeout and all the things that we're, we've all gotten used to in the recent, last few months? What would the roles look like and be different? And how would I structure the work around those? And then who do I bring back in and who do I need to go find that really is going to match those roles well? So we're it's beginning with the end in mind, like Stephen Covey said in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People 20, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. We can do a bit of that. It's not going to eliminate the bad hires. It's not going to eliminate us make, doing the short-term thinking, which we're all, we're all certainly capable of doing many times. But it, it puts a pause and it helps us to be a bit more mindful about making smart decisions for the business that are going to serve us long term. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the idea of um, who am I going to bring back and and what do you want to reintroduce to this? Uh, you know, what, it's an opportunity that's a bittersweet one, as we say. Um, but you know, I know there are lots of organizations who are saying, okay, well, we want to bring these people. We need people. We we but we don't want to bring these people back because we know that they have a history of you know, their their performance has been historically spotty and shaky, and maybe they were a bad hire. And um, it, it seems like for a lot of owners, they could be a little bit too excited about not bringing people back. Um, and to that, it's almost like, well, we should have had a little bit more of a communicative structure with that person where they didn't really have any misconceptions about how they were doing or, or what was going on with their their employment and if you don't bring somebody back um it, I, I feel as though you at least owe them some kind of an explanation because a lot of people are asking um well why wasn't i brought back and as you know terrible as it sounds to tell somebody exactly why um for you know 
various reasons, it seems like being transparent with those individuals would be a, a best practice. I'm all for transparency in any way we can do it and being authentic with people. So um, ideally, if someone's not meeting the standards of the role, we're having that conversation all along mm. with someone. And so it doesn't come as a surprise if they wouldn't be br brought back into a role or if they're exited from the organization. Um, I, I, the very first job I ever had professionally, the cultural rule in the organization was that if you got a performance review and something was a surprise, that that reflected poorly on the manager, not on you. Yeah. Um, and so the expectation, which I loved that cultural rule, and I didn't realize until much later in my career that that was not the rule in most places at all. Um, and I think that's a great rule for all of us to aspire to, that standard of it shouldn't be a surprise to someone if they're not meeting the expectations or they're not brought back or they're not, uh, or they're not um, so, you know, selected for the role or exited from the organization. That should be, uh, that should be, a foregone conclusion, maybe, because of the good communication you've had all along. Now, I say that out loud, and Chris, I know there's people <laughs> listening to that thinking like, okay, well, I didn't do that over the last six months. And so, you know, we can't go back in the past, of course. Um, so I, I think this is where the reality of time and resources, it just has to come into play of do you as a business owner at this time of crisis, have the time to be able to give feedback to people who may not come back into the organization and to give an explanation and to spend the time to do that. And I think if you have the bandwidth to do that and the ability to do that, um, fabulous. And that would be a wonderful thing to do for people. And if you haven't done it yet, um, doing it now is more helpful than probably not ever doing it. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, this is a, a huge shift for all of us. And um, I think that it also is an opportunity for you to hit the reset button and to say, well, you know what, um, there's every organization like this is going through this right now. And um, this is an opportunity for you to do a bit of a reset and not necessarily have to give everyone an explanation as to why you're not bringing them back into the organization, um, because there's so much that is changing. And the context for why people are not coming back is multifaceted and complex as it is right now. Hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I, and I think that's really a personal decision for each leader, for each owner to decide how and when they want to have those conversations. Uh, but the invitation I would make is regardless of how you handle that situation with people who may not be coming back um, and what that looks like and what those conversations are, of making the commitment going forward to saying, hey, if I have someone who's not meeting expectations, then I'm going to start having that be a regular conversation, that I'm going to have um, coaching conversations. I'm going to use something like the accountability dial. Has, has Jonathan Raymond been on your show, Chris? Yes, I, yes. I, I thought so. So that would be a wonderful resource for folks to go back and look in your library on uh, Jonathan's great on this wonderful process of making mentions and making invitations to employees when they're not meeting expectations. Also, when they are meeting expectations, it can be used in a positive way too. And so if you're not already in the habit of doing something like that, I think that's a wonderful place now to start. As people are coming back, here's an opportunity to do things a little differently than you've done in the past and be giving regular feedback so that when things aren't working, it's not a surprise for people. And they do have the choice to change or to exit the organization, but they know why that's not working. So we're not just re um, uh, organizing the business and restarting things in the business. We're restarting things with how we conduct ourselves in the business. And it certainly is a um, a red flag to have those kinds of, oh, that's right. I never did talk to them about that, but I do kind of not want them to come back, <laughs> even though we never had that yeah. conversation. So it's, it, it's an indictment, to, uh, but also an encouragement to say, well, now you have an opportunity to, with this new crop of people to do the right thing and, and make it a, a culture in an environment of, of feedback, communication, and that, that, um, good relationship. And as Jonathan Raymond says, uh, you have the opportunity to have good authority in your role. Um, I, I want to go yeah. back. Oh, go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say one other point on that. I mean, it, you know, it's such an unusual situation. And this is where I think it's really personal for each leader. I mean, if, if someone's been out of work for two or three months, and then you're making a decision then not to have them come back, you know, I, I think that's really personal as far as how you handle that of what do you say? How much do you say? Um, it, so that's going to vary a lot by organization. But I think the bigger invitation would be going forward, make a decision to give that feedback, to think about the role first um, and to uh, and to be doing coaching regularly. Because if you if you use this opportunity and when in every crisis, there's opportunity. If you use this opportunity to make a shift for yourself, if you haven't done it before for whatever reason, um, here's the opportunity to have the reset button and say, okay, going forward, now as we're coming back, now as this business looks different, I'm going to make a commitment to once a day um, to find something to give positive reinforcement on and once a day to, um, to find an opportunity to make mentions and to do cor some corrective coaching. If you're not doing that already, that'll be huge for your business going forward. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well said. I, I, I wanted to kind of go back to what you were t talking about with succession planning and like who's going to replace these people in these roles, especially with like management is a huge one. Um, when managers leave, it's almost like we, we have this um, <laughs> ability to put somebody in place and then be like, boy, that's really nice that they're there and then forget about it until they're gone and kind of wake up to the reality that either we are going to be the manager or somebody else that we haven't really been paying attention to that much has, you know, got to take that place. Um, one of the things that I find it, it happens is there's, well, there's not a lot of places for people in coffee bars, for example, to go in terms of advancement. We're trying to work that out in different levels and it becomes pretty granular to like barista, head barista, you know, shift lead. And we <laughs> create lots of little, you know, intermediary uh, leadership roles to try to fulfill that desire for people to advance in such a small organization, you know, word spreads quickly when you've got just a staff of 10 people. Uh, how do you go about not um, defrauding people, I, I, I guess, like leading them on to say like their, their management material, like can you observe them and really make a good assessment of their ability to be a manager or even willingness to do so without promising something to them that will potentially not even materialize? Well, I think the first part there is not promising something that may not materialize. And this is where role first comes into play. And this is where I got in trouble with that story I shared from 20 years ago is I created a role, created in quotes, a role that probably should not have been there because I was trying to appease a single employee versus thinking about it first, what does the business need? So I think the, the mistake most of the time is to start creating roles just around a particular person or just to retain someone for another six months. Then that's where that becomes complicated. And by the way, I, I have done that before and it has worked. Um, so I'm not saying that's you can never do that. I just think it's something we should be really cautious about of creating roles just around a particular person, and especially with a part-time staff that becomes, it becomes very resource intensive and potentially dangerous for a small business to, to begin to do that. Um, rather, it's starting with, as a business owner, what are the roles that this shop needs? What does that look like? What are the two or three or four roles? And being really realistic with the career path, what that looks like or what it doesn't look like so that people have a clear sense of where they may go in the organization or not and what the opportunities are. Um, so that's first and foremost. And then I think part of it too is also from the owner standpoint or the leader of the organization is spending some time thinking regularly about however many roles those are, two, three, four, of thinking about who within the organization is capable of stepping into those roles. And I learned, uh, I learned a, a concept that I thought was really helpful years ago from Carnegie that uh, when doing succession planning is I would often, if I was thinking about someone for a role, 
long term, uh, six months from now, a year from now, possibly moving into a new role, is um, one helpful exercise to go through is to take out the job description for that role. And of course, this implies there is a job description, right? So that's a that's a place to go if you don't already have that. Is is on paper, not just in your head, on paper. What does shift supervisor look like? What does the job description for that? What are the skills that that person needs to have? Barista, what does that job description look like? I mean, a lot of people have that in their minds, but I think in a lot of organizations that isn't necessarily written down what that job mm-hmm. description is. So, so getting that in writing is key. That's part of putting the getting the role down first. Because once it's in writing, then you can go to the job description and you can think about that job description and you can think about the person or persons in the organization that may be a candidate for being a shift supervisor or being a general manager or whatever the next role is or whatever the role incoming is. And then you can do an assessment. And the assessment that I think is very simple for many of us to do is a three-step assessment. And it's just an ABC. And the A assessment is um, on this particular part of the job responsibility um, or on this particular, uh, this particular part of the job role, this person is competent and they're ready to do this today. B would be this person is not yet ready for this particular skill set or this particular um, step on the, the job role, but they probably will be with some development at some point in the future. And then there's the C rating, which is this person is probably never going to realistically be able to do this part of the role or responsibility, right? And so for most people, as you assess them and you're looking at roles, there's going to be a lot of you know A's, B's, and C's. They're going to be all across the board. And so just taking the time to go through that, if you've got a couple of candidates for a position and thinking through, okay, what are the skills that this person needs for this role? And how do they stack up? Are there a lot of A's? Are there a lot of B's? And that way I know that this person could potentially develop into that, but I'm going to need to spend a bunch of time to do that. Or are there some C's of things that this person's probably never going to be good at? And could I live with that in this role? Or uh, is that something that's going to be a deal killer that there might only be one particular skill in this role that this person's never going to be able to do well, but is that a core competency for the role that I simply can't make that exception for? And and then when you make an exception, you're doing it consciously. So if someone comes into the role and you know that they don't have the skill sets in this thing, then that's where you may make the adjustment or you might have someone else do that part of the job. Um, But again, this is all coming back to Chris, role first, right? Mm -hmm. So what does the role need? Who and then who within the business or outside the business is able to line up and 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 fill that role and who do I need to develop? And that way, as you see the bees especially showing up on your your tracking, I'm like, okay, what do I need to do now in the next couple of months to prepare this person for the next role or the next responsibility or whatever that looks like? I love that. I, I, that's a great tool. And you answered my question, uh, my follow-up question there, which was going to be basically like, what if you <laughs> just, there's no good candidates and you have to make a decision in the moment, like literally have to. Um, it, and you said it perfectly, like you're making a conscious decision that this is an imperfect choice and a necessity in the moment. And at yeah. least you're not, you know, pulling the wool over your own eyes and maybe even theirs. Um, cause again, you might've already been communicating with them about, about their, um, strengths and their, uh, areas for improvement. Um, one point of detail that I, I did want to, uh, get some clarity on was when we're doing these assessments, like there's a lot of different methods for being able to collect that data. And I think a lot of us have been so used to collecting data on the back end of a point of sale system or it's customer surveys and, you know, just remotely, like fill this out and we'll see if your answers line up. And if so, we'd prove that your values are values that line up with the organization. But it does seem like that wouldn't really fly very well. So it, this kind of um, assessment seems like you would need to have some some FaceTime and some, some side-to-side work time and, uh, you know, just substantial observance of the individual in lots of different situations to actually make these kinds of assessments and grades. Yeah, indeed. It's, and it is subjective, of course. 
It's better than not doing it at all, though. So that's part of the invitation here, which is even if you do this imperfectly, even if it's subjective, even if you don't have as many data points as you'd want, just by going through and thinking about the role first and thinking about who on the team has this particular skill on the line item, on the job description, and who doesn't and who could be developed, you're going to make better decisions than you would if you didn't do that at all, or you just went off of gut feel, which is what happens in a lot of these situations, especially when you need someone, right? Um, so that said, you can get better at doing that and improve your odds by taking the time to do a little bit of observation. Maybe before you bring in someone for a role, you have them do a test shift or, and you pay them hourly or whatever you do in your organization, but you get some time to do some observation first. And that's part of the hiring process is let's have you work for uh, 60 minutes or 90 minutes or whatever it is. And you get a little bit of that more of that data point. Um, and that's going to look different in every organization, every business, of course. But the, you know, sometimes watching someone and just observing how they interact with a customer for 15 or 20 minutes can help you to avoid making a bad decision that would cost you six months of headaches. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to invest a little bit of time there to observe some of the key things, that can be huge and, and vice versa too. I've seen situations where people have interviewed very poorly for roles and then they get in a situation where they're doing something practically and you watch this person like, oh my gosh, they're amazing with customers and they're like, they're energetic and they're enthusiastic and you would never know it from sitting down and talking to them, you know, in an interview situation. Um, but, but it turns out they've got so much that's, that's there that just didn't show up in the formal or action. So uh, to the extent we can do some of that, that's, that's great. And, and maybe even in the interview process, like get people doing some of the things that they would normally do. Uh, if you're, if you're going to hire someone who's going to interact a lot with customers, um, you know, rather than just having them sit down at a table to do an interview, which is the thing I see anytime I walk into a coffee shop, it seems like there's always a manager sitting there uh, having a conversation with a potential <laughs> at the table. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, go ahead, do that and take them across the street and run an errand um, or take them out for a walk or do something that they wouldn't expect you to do and get them out of that formal interaction and see how they interact with the world. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to do a bit of that, you get more data points and you go, oh, interesting. Like we walked into this, you know, we walked into the shop next door and this person, you know, was friendly and interacted with people. Uh, or they didn't. And and that helps you to just get some more of those data points to be able to make a better assessment. Perfect. So well, going away from this conversation, um, you know, first steps for managers in charge of hiring owners in charge of hiring, what would you say, like the, the thing that they need to do this week is, you know, as soon as they turn this uh, interview off is what? If you haven't already written down what the roles and the job descriptions are in your organization, do that. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Take 15 minutes and get on a piece of paper. What are the responsibilities of a barista in our business? And you're not going to get it perfect. You're not going to get everything, but you're going to get the big things um, just by setting down for 10 or 15 minutes and writing that out. Same thing for ship supervisor, same thing for general manager, whatever the key roles are in the business. If you took an hour, and just all the roles down on paper, and then use that as the framework to start thinking about these decisions and assessment points, that will get you further along than most people have done on this of thinking strategically long-term for the business. Excellent. Dave, uh, as always, I really appreciate your insights on the show. Um, where can people go to tune into your podcast and just all the work that you've uh, done through Coaching for Leaders? Well, thank you, Chris, for the opportunity. And uh, my work is all about helping leaders get better through great conversations. And so folks can find everything over at coachingforleaders.com. Uh, your show is is one of my all-time favorites. It's kind of one of the uh, podcasts that inspired me to start this podcast. And so I recommend everybody subscribe to Dave's uh, podcast as soon as they possibly can. And again, Dave, I, I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. 
My pleasure. And thank you for being on Coaching for Leaders a couple of times and bringing us yes. the perspective from small for small business owners and for managing part-time staff. You've been so helpful to our audience and your wisdom. So thanks a ton. I'm super grateful for it. Well, Dave touched on so many great points in this conversation. It would totally be worth re-listening to this episode, taking notes, and creating a plan moving forward. Some of the things that really stuck out to me, two in particular, just notice how far-reaching the implications of your decisions in staffing are. The uh, people that are working in the cafe, uh, the customers, yourself, the business, um, the individual that is either a good hire or not a good hire, or the individual who got promoted that maybe shouldn't have been. There is a lot riding on these decisions. And to that end, the second thing is creating a framework that you hold yourself accountable to for thinking through this type of decision is so critical because we're human beings. And especially in the coffee bar environment, we are prone to getting you know, emotionally involved in these decisions and making really quick judgments based on that. And without some kind of a tool or framework for thinking that is uh, kind of a third party, then we're gonna be subject maybe to perpetuating those decisions. And you know, the point made about how we conduct ourselves as leaders from this point forward, not only do we have the opportunity to bring in um, staff that are uh, better fit for the organization and the right fit for different positions, but we have the opportunity to change who we are in the organization going forward. Um, and hopefully you have enough self-knowledge and realization about what those things are for yourself. And they definitely impact the organization. So a huge thank you to Dave for joining us again on the show. You can find the link to uh, coachingforleaders.com in the show notes, as well as Dave's past episodes. And uh, I'll include links to uh, my past episodes on uh, Coaching for Leaders as well. And if you haven't subscribed to Coaching for Leaders, I would highly encourage you to do so. Um, Dave has, uh, uh, it's like an Alexandrian library uh, of, of amazing professional and business insights on that podcast. And so uh, definitely subscribe to it. And thank you again, Dave. We really appreciate you. Now, if you have any questions for me, uh, you want to reach out, Chris at keystotheshop.com, feedback, uh, comments, et cetera. Uh, again, if you want to work with Keys to the Shop consulting or coaching, uh, whether that's just over the phone coaching that you want to sign up for uh, or, in, or in depth where we get to work on your menu, we work on your business structure, uh, work through some issues, the sky's the limit really. So reach out. Chris at keys to the shop.com. I'd love to talk with you and see if uh, working with keys to the shop is the right fit for you. Uh, coming up on shift break this week is going to be a shift break as sort of a uh, companion to this episode. We're going to be going over how to write a good job description. This is one of the things that Dave had really encouraged us to do. And there are some elements I think that you're going to really want to have in your job descriptions as you set out to create those this week. And so tune in on Thursday for uh, creating job descriptions on shift break. And hopefully that will, will help you in this process. And with that, that is the end of our show. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate every single one of you. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>